Hello and welcome. We're going to get started here in uh, just a minute or so. All right, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for the Industry Expert Forum, Audiology Industry Trends for 2024. You're currently attending part one of a three-part series. Parts two and three will take place the next two Thursdays at this exact same time, so if you have not yet registered for those, make sure you do. There will be QR codes available at the end of today's presentation that you'll be able to scan to register if you have not registered for those sessions. My name is Chelsea Traceder, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Pivot Hearing, a practice development services group. I'm also the practice administrator for my family's audiology practice located in Northern California, as well as one of the co-founders of My Vitals Pro. People always critique my public speaking skills by saying I talk too fast, but I just wanted to let you know I'm intentionally going to talk fast today because we have so much to cover in such a short amount of time. So I'm now going to quickly introduce our panel of experts for today's session. I have the great pleasure of being joined by Michael Guyden, Vice President of Commercial Sales at Signia, who has more than a decade of experience in the industry. I'm also thrilled to be joined by Dan Qual, who is an audiologist and the Director of Strategic Initiatives for Fuel Medical Group. And finally, Will Diles, who is an experienced private practice manager, as well as a practice consultant with Pivot Hearing and one of the founders of My Vitals Pro, the hearing care industry's first and only interactive KPI dashboard and practice management tool. I wanna share our disclosures really quick. Michael Guyden is employed by WSA Audiology, which derives revenue through the wholesale distribution of hearing aids. Dan Qual is employed by Fuel Medical Group, which derives revenue through the wholesale distribution of hearing aids. And Will and I work for Kenwood Hearing Centers, Pivot Hearing and My Vitals Pro, which derive revenue through the retail and wholesale distribution of hearing aids, as well as software subscription sales. So we're gonna be sharing a lot of data today. So I wanted to kind of explain upfront where those numbers are gonna come from. We're gonna be sharing high level publicly available HIA data from 2018 to 2023. We will be using My Vitals Pro data, which comes from the NBP business intelligence tool, which is powered by data from over 750 audiology and hearing care clinic locations, representing almost half a billion dollars in projected revenue with data ranging from 2010 through last night. We're also using data on Medicare Advantage that we get from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Okay, one final bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to ask them at any time in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom interface, and we're gonna spend time after the presentation is over answering those. So with that, let's get started. Here we are at part one of the Audiology Industry Trends webinar, which is unveiling macro and industry trends. We thought it would be really beneficial for you to hear from someone on the manufacturing side, and there's nobody better than Michael Guyton. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael. Thanks, Chelsea. I really appreciate the uh, the introduction and, and obviously the opportunity to speak to, to so many of you about, you know, a lot of the changes that are happening, you know, right in front of us, you know, when it comes to the, the, you know, the space that we operate in, which is the hearing healthcare market. And as you can see, you know, one of the things that we look at from the manufacturing side are these specific channels because they all are very unique in nature and they all require, you know, different different needs, you know, from the manufacturing side. So for us, it's all it's very important and vital to, to know what's actually happening in, in, the, in this market. So as you can see on this slide, you know, obviously we're, we're continuing to see this shift, you know, with, with managed care uh, and Medicaid. And, it, and it's, it's the, the chart clearly shows it's still the fastest growing channel. And it's definitely being fueled by these Medicare Advantage plans, which Will and Dan are going to talk a lot about, you know, throughout the course of the, of the next 30 minutes. We do still continue to see that the retail channel is increasing as well, being the, the second fastest growing with it being really prompted by, you know, those retail channels like Costco and even manufacturer acquisitions. But I think to no one's surprise, we are continuing to see an erosion, you know, in the independent market you know, with it being the fastest shrinking. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to that, that that far right side as well, because that small 3% we have listed as other, those are some of the other, you know, direct -to consumer channels, some of the online channels. And I do feel, and I'll show you some data here in a little bit, that will show that there is an opportunity here, you know, for, for our marketplace, for U.S. providers as well, because there are still patients, you know, entering in, into this channel, uh, and it didn't create as much fear as I thought, as, as I think many of us thought it would 
you know, at the beginning. Hey, Michael, before we uh, jump off of the slide, I wanted to just take some time and, and uh, break down a couple of these on a, on, on a, a more macro basis. So notice, uh, you know, it, we see that the independent is the fastest shrinking when that, so that means the, the private practice, what I like to call the medical model. But we say that and immediately people kind of get a negative. They say, uh oh, we're in trouble, but it's still the largest channel. So talk about the importance of this channel to the, to the manufacturing community. Yeah, it, it's still it's still the most vital channel. You know, it's still the the, the most common way that, that patients are finding their way into the clinics. And for us on the manufacturing side, it's continuing to make sure that we bring products to the marketplace that are, that not only address you know what these patients are looking for. You know, I think folks have seen specifically from Signia. You know, we we have designed and manufactured and brought to market a lot of different consumer centric type products. You know, like a Styletto, like an Active, like a, a rechargeable silk. Because those are the types of products that, that this channel is still thriving and asking for. So for us, we have to be a, a, a significant part you know, of keeping this this channel alive and vibrant uh, by making sure that we bring out products uh, that can continue to help those patients in need. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in the next few slides as well as, as to what is that patient type and what, is, what does it look like currently. Yeah, I, I also want to just because this is a, a an issue that that we see on our side of the aisle uh, dealing with private practices, both in audiology and uh, in hearing instrument specialists uh, in the medical ENT community. But I, I see a lot of um, animosity uh, from the providers towards the manufacturers for participating in the particularly in this Medicare Advantage space. And I, and I guess I want to to you know waggle my finger at my colleagues and saying, look at you. You have to understand how the manufacturers need to get their product to the marketplace. We can't take and ask a manufacturer to sit on the sideline for, on 23% of the market of units are going through that channel. What we have to do as professionals is understand how do we take advantage of that channel? Because you are using us as that as the way. And we have to make business decisions. Should we be in? Should we be out? How do we participate? What products? So I, I just... Yeah. And Dan, you make a great point because I think when, when Will gets into the data, what, what, what folks on this call are going are gonna to notice is it is different in every market. But we are, but we are seeing that you know it, some, some of these plans, some of these types of, of methods and patients are coming into the, in, into the channel you know, are going to be different and unique. So like you mentioned, Dan, from a manufacturer standpoint, we, we need to be where the patients are. Uh, but we also need to make sure that that we're, we're providing you know not only products but also services in partnership and collaboration you know with groups like Fuel, Pivot, and MVP. It's vital uh, you know for the health and, and and for the continued growth of our of our industry. Very good. Yeah, so maybe we go to the next slide. You know, so a few years ago, you know, at Signia, you know, every, you know, we do an annual event called the Aspire event. And one of the things that we did a little bit differently was we wanted to get you know real feedback you know from from the, the customers that were going to be attending, but also you know you know customers and practitioners out in the marketplace. And we wanted to get a better idea of what are some of those those perceived issues in the marketplace. And as you can see, we got a lot of answers. You know, it ranges all the way from you know higher no-show rates to difficulty hiring HCPs to competition online and OTC. But when, but when you break this down, so if we go to the next slide, when you break this down. There are, you know, four or five, you know, four issues that, that definitely rise to the top with managed care being the top one at 26%. But we're also seeing, you know, those, those perceived issues center around, you know, online competitors. You know, too many patients are maybe scheduling issues. You know, some folks are seeing a reduction in new patients or patients that are slow to upgrade. These are the, the areas, again, that are perceived. You know, they are real because we, we see them throughout the country. You know, and again, it's part of our responsibility to continue to help you navigate these ever-changing and choppy waters. Yeah, talk to me. I, I, I found it really interesting, particularly that 79% is, you know, are these these five issues, but you have almost one that's contradictory. And and maybe you and I can have a little dialogue. One says yeah. patients slower, well, one is patients slower to upgrade, but reducing new patient, reduced new patients. So saying, I don't have an, any new patients, but then I'll, right next to it, you have too many patients, difficult scheduling. And so we seem to see a conflict there. Do you think that that's a factor that's been involved with the TPA? The TPA has grown the market? I mean, obviously we've seen market growth over the last several years. So is that creating the conflict? Yeah, it, it potentially, Dan. I mean, I, I do think that, again, the patient is finding a new way to come into the clinic. I think, 
you know, we have seen cases, you know, you know when we're out in the field, co-traveling and visiting, you know, customers where I think they're having a hard time identifying, you know, how some of these patients are coming in and, they, and even what to do with them when they do come in. So, you know, obviously you're not looking at a managed care patient sometimes the same way that you're looking at a private pay patient. So that, that could be driving, you know, some of this as well. But I also think that it also opens up an opportunity, you know, and, and that's where I'm excited about this webinar series and some of the things that, that the folks at MVP are doing is it's giving them a better sense and better a better a viewpoint of who these patients are, how they're coming into the practice, and how they're going to impact my bottom line at the end of the day. All right, great. Well, I'm excited to talk about the next slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we talked about that opportunity, and Dan mentioned it earlier, and I, I mentioned it earlier as well. You know, so you know, all the manufacturers are playing in this space at some at some level. You know, at the WSA, we partnered with Sony, and they've been able to, to provide us with some pretty interesting data. You know, if you look at that top the top section of this of this graph, these are stats that we have seen and we have talked about for 20 years. You know, the the first time fit rate, the average age of some of these patients coming into the category. More importantly, that time from awareness to solution at seven to 10 years. And then also just their, their awareness to a hearing aid brand. We haven't seen these numbers shift a whole lot until OTC entered, entered the marketplace. And what we're seeing from, you know, from you know, data that was provided you know, by, by Sony is that a lot of these folks are first time wearers. Their average age is 59. So they're on average seven years younger than those traditional patients that were coming in, you know, looking for technology. But more importantly, their journey has been shortened as well from seven to 10 to three to five. And they do recognize brand awareness. So when I talked about that, that, that less than 3% or that, that long, smaller portion of that graph that we were showing earlier, this is where that opportunity is because these patients are finding their way into the marketplace. And I think many of you have probably heard this and painfully heard it, that I don't have a five or $6,000 problem. That's what some of these patients are saying, you know, as, as they are, are, are finding these other channels you know, to, to, to enter the marketplace, enter, the, enter their journey, but seek care in healthcare. We want them seeing you because we know that at the end of the day, in the last 12 months, the, the, the market for, for um, OTC devices, and, I, and I, I hope you guys are ready for this because it's a big number, 500,000 units were sold through, through uh, OTC. This is not just Sony, this is all of those brands, you know, combined. So that market is growing and it's providing an opportunity you know, for you to be that first point of contact so that when they enter this, their journey, that three to five years or four years earlier than the traditional patient, they have a hearing healthcare professional right there to help them through the ups and downs and ebbs and flows of, of using technology in general. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. So I addressing this from our side of the aisle, you know, when we talk to our customers all across the country, um, one of the things that we we hear, I, 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 was, I almost heard a collective sigh of relief from all of our providers because they said, OTC is not an issue. Nobody's yeah. even talking to us about it in our clinics. And then I talked to uh, individuals like you who have a pulse on the market and you're saying, hey, there's 500,000 units moving through this channel. And we don't really truly know how many others because there's not like yeah. an HIA where we can add exactly. them up. And so suddenly, uh, you know, my, my uh, alarms go off because it, I, what I look at, I go back to those channels and what I'm seeing is the evolution or the, the creation of perhaps a new channel coming in. You know, when you look at how people come into the market, some are going to come to us through the medical model. They're going to reach out for their audiologist, their ENT, they're hearing us from a specialist. They want that medical care. They want the long-term, uh, you know, but they come to us directly there. Some are now coming, we see through the, their um, their Medicare Advantage plans. You know, they call up and they all of a sudden that's how they're finding the market. There's a potential that their people are finding a new market online. So where where are most of the OTCs being moved through since they're not coming through our clinics? Yeah, where, where do you see yeah, we're, the we're seeing them through those traditional online channels, whether it's online uh, and Amazon, whether it's it's through other you know types of online platforms. So these patients are going out and researching and searching, you know, you know, through those those different methods. But it doesn't. It, but it's not to say that those same patients can't find their way to, you know, the, the local audiology clinic, you know, in their neighborhood, and, and still have that same conversation, but be exposed to prescriptive technology as well, which is, you know, what, what we know long term is is, is going to help them, you know, with their need. Yep. 
Well, we could spend a lot of time on this one. We so I, I think what where I wanted to move to from here was trying to take all those issues and you you know from talking with everybody here on our expert panels, we kind of you know drilled it down to these kind of three areas that we want to talk about over the next um, two or three sessions. So number one is this Medicare Advantage program. And it includes and, and goes into the schedule and time management. We're seeing this all across the country, and um, we'll have the opportunity in, in the future uh, sessions to really take a look at what the time factors are involved with these patients. Um, we're also seeing, obviously, a decline in the, in the new private pay patients that are coming in. And so this is where Will um, has really opened my eyes. I've had a good chance to talk to him. I'll tell you more about uh, the work he's doing but opened our eyes to really look at how that's reducing and what what do we do as professionals to make sure we don't take our eye off of the private practice or the, the patients that want to buy through us independently outside of a TPA, um, you know, private pay patients uh, and purchases, because it's it's a it's a really vital when we look at the data, it's a really vital part of the of the marketplace. Um, we also want to talk about the reduction of the new private patients. So we're going to talk about how we're going to bring some more of those in. And then finally, we want to talk about maintaining the, the clinic patient base. And to me, nothing is more important now for the future of the independence particularly when I see, looked at that last slide and said, if I could capture a patient at 59 instead of at uh, 66, uh, what would that mean for the purchase cycle? And even though maybe it's I have to have conversation about OTC or maybe I have to carry a couple OTCs, but if I could capture them, what would that mean? And I think that, that talks to our ability as professionals. How, how do we insert ourselves into the patient's journey at an earlier level? So those will all be all things we talk about. So let's go on to the next slide and we're obviously pushed on time. So I if, Will, before you start, I want to just, um, the data you're going to see that's coming out of My Vitals Pro is something that the industry has never been, been seen before. So first of all, you, ha you have to make a state. I've, I've spent a lot of time looking and comparing the dental industry and the optometry industry and the hearing aid industry and the hearing audiology industry. And one of the things that's really shows up is that uh, both dentistry and optometry they have great baseline um, numbers on what's happening in uh, in the in their industry. You can go and you can see what what's taking place because of the way they're collecting data at a clinic level, at the private practice level. And our benchmarking is very lacking. And so for the first time, when I you know got to talking to Will, and I've actually known the Dials family for years, but. Um, we started looking at this data and it is super interesting. And then Will and I get together and we geek out over all the numbers that are coming out. But I'm going to turn this over to Will and I want you to, you know, we'll have some conversations about the data we're pulling here, but he has some really interesting numbers coming through his uh, group that tell us more about insights on the Medicare Advantage space. So Will, I'll turn it to you and we'll get, give a quick overview of how many, how many clinics, uh, how many uh, providers, uh, how much revenue, how many units are, are flowing through the data that we're analyzing here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Dan. Um, so uh, we, we, the, the MVP data set consists of uh, approximately 800 FTEs. So full-time equivalent providers. That's the uh, approximate size of the data set that's growing. Um, so that's what it is as of right now. Um, uh, we're projected to do something like 126,000 private pay hearing aids and uh, approaching half a billion dollars in total revenue, uh, running through the, the data set. So that's kind of roughly what we're talking about here. So it's not a, um, uh, you know, entirely representative sample of the private practice market, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a non-trivial uh, amount. I think we can definitely draw some reasonable conclusions from it. Um, but what we're going to talk about here first is uh, we've established, we've heard it for years, especially on the sl a few slides back, that a, a really kind of primary concern of private practice owners is the increase in patients showing up in their clinics with third-party hearing aid benefits. Um, and as we know, the main driver of this is uh, the growth in Medicare Advantage that's been seen across the country over the past seven or eight years. So we, we got the data that we're going to go through on the next few slides from CMS.gov. It's all publicly available. Anybody can go download it. Um, and what we did was we just looked at the enrollment numbers by years. If you could uh, go back, Kate. Thank you. Um, yeah, so what we can see here, um, we can look at, you can see that the uh, the pink is the Medicare Advantage, green is traditional Medicare. 
So we can look at those enrollment numbers over time. And there's just a clear trend that Medicare Advantage has been growing and growing year over year um, with, with a slight de decrease in traditional Medicare enrollment during that same time period. And as of January last month, um, most recent open enrollment period closed, we um, there is now more patients in Medicare Advantage than traditional Medicare, which is the first time that's ever happened. Um, and when you look at this, this the growth in the Medicare Advantage channel and then the growth in the third party, which we're going to talk to talk about in just a moment, it's pretty clear that the the, the two are closely related. And if we look at the Medicare Advantage penetration rates over time, which is the percentage of Medicare eligible individuals enrolling in a Medicare Advantage plan as opposed to a traditional Medicare plan, that number has gone from as low as uh, you know 36 percent or so in 2018, all the way up to slightly more than 50 percent. So over half of people that are Medicare eligible have elected a Medicare Advantage plan. So that's one of the things I think, you know, when we take a look at the decline, and obviously you and I have been looking at the data on, on private pay patients versus the TPA patients. And um, I think one of the th things that's causing the decline is, is many um, clinics are seeing patients who may, they may be fit originally as a private pay patient are coming back in and suddenly they have this benefit. And um, they say, hey, you know, can you help, can you fit me under my benefit now? And so all of a sudden we're seeing this decline or reduction in, um, you know, in the amount of people that are, are actually paying for it privately. And one of the surprising things, and of course, again, teasing, teasing for the next time we get together is taking a look at the, what the financial impact is with those different kinds of patients and what it really means to our clinic. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's all very interesting. Let's go to, let's go to the, uh, the heat maps and take a look at the penetration across the country. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, the map that you're seeing here on the screen um, this is showing enrollment data from 2018, and it's broken down by county. So the counties that are in green are those with less than 20% Medicare Advantage penetration, and red is greater than 50%. Um, so as you can see, there is a handful of pockets throughout the country where there is some, uh, you know, some red, some high concentration as of 2018. But for the most part, you see a lot of green and some of the other colors. So not not quite as uh, not quite as much as we see now. So if we flip to uh, 2024 and we look at this exact same map, same same data, but just for 2024's enrollment year, you can see a, a whole bunch more red. So we've known this is a regional issue. Um, it, it hasn't. It's it's Medicare Advantage has grown everywhere, but it hasn't had quite the same impact everywhere. So if we look at the eastern third of the country on the next slide, there, there we go. Um, the eastern third of the country, which represents approximately two thirds of the population in the same kind of way. So this is 2018. There's some red in Minnesota, Western Pennsylvania, but if you look at it in 2024, it is a, a totally different story. It's pretty much red everywhere. The vast majority of these counties are now well over 50%. So if you operate a clinic in any of these states, you've probably noticed this, uh, this issue of patients showing up with third party, you know, maybe a bit earlier than some other parts of the country. And it's uh, likely something you're dealing with regularly. And of course, obviously, as these changes have taken place, um, the strategies that it, at the clinical level have to start to change. And that's one of the things, again, that we'll be able to share as we move on down the line is some of the, we've seen some clinics take some of these strategies and, and implement them. We can, we'll be able to show the data changes, uh, financial changes from those, and then uh, take a look at the, at the impact of these this TPA. But this is not going away. And so, Anybody that thinks that, well, you know, I'm going to stay out of the game for a while. Well, you've just half of the market is uh, half of the half of the Medicare market is uh, in is in these channels. And so we have to figure out how we're going to compete with those. I think. It's yeah, huge. absolutely. Dan, I think it shows, it, you know, the consumer's choices, what they want out of their Medicare plans, the ancillary benefits, you know, hearing hearing yeah. being a big one. But there's plenty of others. That's what's attracting these folks. And so this is this is primarily driven, I believe, by consumer preferences. So we just have to yeah. understand and that like, and operate accordingly. Yeah. And I always like to point out that, that, you know, really what they're offering is different than what, what is offered traditionally by uh, independents all across the country, not to, not to get, go down the rabbit hole of uh, bundled versus unbundled. But when we see people start on their hearing journey and they're in the medical model, these people are getting taken care of um, for a long period of time. And generally speaking in a bundled format, what's being, uh, propagated by the TPAs and also by the retailers really is really a transactional event. And that is, they just want people to, you know, but it, 
test a hearing, you have a hearing loss, get a hearing aid, you're fixed. And that we know um, is not the case. These people need to be um, taken care of. Um, we need to, they've got this problem for life and we need to take care of them. So I, I like to call it my apples and oranges. And of course, that'll come back around as we talk about alternatives uh, in the market in other sessions. But it really is a different product that's being offered through the TPAs. I think it's important to, to note that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. So um, we understand that that the growth in Medicare Advantage has had a huge impact on the private practice space. We've all experienced that over the last several years. Um, so within the MVP data set, um, we can take a look and see kind of broken down by channel, you know, private pay versus third party to see what we've seen, um, what type of growth has, has taken place during these same years. So on the top of this uh, slide here, we can see private pay units in the data set uh, by year. Um, and, you know, over this period of time, with the, the exception of 2020, there's been, would not surprising, we've seen, you know, steady growth um, of, you know, approximately 9% year over year on average during this period of time. Uh, on the third party side of things, the growth has been much more, uh, much more uh, aggressive. So the absolute number of units is still quite a bit lower, um, as you can see on the just the numbers there at the top. So the number, the unit totals are still smaller than the private pay channel, which we saw early on one of those uh, very first slides. But the growth rates are significantly higher. So we're seeing 37% average annual growth over this period for third party, which is means that this side of the business is growing essentially four times as fast as the private pay side. And if we look at it kind of in total here, we can see the growth rates year over year broken down by channel. Um, total units are growing about 14% on average, meaning that's the number of units, uh, the total unit growth we're experiencing, but a lot of that's coming on that third party side and especially um, in this most recent year. So on the chart down below, you can see that the percentage of units that were um, third party going back to 2018. So it was, you know, a relatively small percentage of the overall business, but that's really, really grown pretty, pretty fast. And uh, as of last year, 2023, it was approximately 30% of all the hearing aids in the data, in the data set. And on a slightly more uh, perhaps optimistic note, um, we can we look at the same data by quarter. We see that huge jump in the first quarter of 2023 from something like 26 to almost 31 percent. Um, but then it appears to have potentially leveled off, um, and maybe even you know showing a slight uh, decrease. So we have a little bit of data for the first quarter of of this year, although it's not complete yet. Um, but what we're seeing is, yeah, something more like 28%. So this is definitely something we're going to want to keep an eye on to see if this continues to kind of maybe, uh, uh, you know, re regress down to the mean or something like it was. So we'll just be keeping a close eye on these levels here. So what, what do you attribute maybe some of this leveling off and dropping down? Is it uh, the watering down of the programs that, that are getting uh, adopted by the TPAs? Because we've certainly, and the, our data is going to show how they have constantly reduced the, the reimbursement level over years. But um, what else do you attribute to maybe this, this little drop? Yeah, I think anecdotally, we've seen some major uh, Medicare Advantage plans drop the uh, or decrease the amount of benefit for some of these plans over the last several years. So there's there's so many you know these plans are administered at the county level oftentimes so there's so many across the U.S. that it's hard to get a real sense for that but we have seen anecdotally in a few markets the benefits have come down a bit which I think would explain a drop in demand for third party units um, we've also seen private practices start to um, compete a little bit more so and that can be you know either divesting from the third party channel entirely or offering patients alternatives through you know, competitive um, programs that are designed to to kind of give patients an alternative to the third party. So I think it's a combination of things, but um, we'll have to just keep an eye to see if it continues. Right. Well, with that, we probably should open it up for questions because we're running low on time. Um, I just, uh, again, a tease for next week. We will start to go through and look at uh, specific numbers for, you know, how much time we spend with each of these patient groups, uh, what our revenue per hour is for these different groups and what it's meaning to our top line um, revenue. And um, so that, that'll that be all next week. And then we'll start to take a look on the third week on what are the strategies we do to try to solve some of these issues at the clinic level. So with that, uh, Chelsea, we'll entertain any questions that might be out there. 
Great. Thanks so much, Dan. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Michael. Uh, like Dan said, in our next session, we're going to be sharing some of that kind of never before seen data about the impacts this is having in clinics. So you're not going to want to miss that. So if you're already registered for parts two and three, you're good to go. If you haven't registered for those, um, you can go ahead and scan these QR codes that are up on the screen right now to get registered. Um, okay, so uh, like Dan suggested, we are going to move to the Q&A portion of our session. If you have to drop off, um, thank you for attending. Um, hopefully you can stay on. I have some great questions here already. And if you have a question that you haven't yet asked, go ahead and drop it in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to them all. So um, this first question I'm going to ask of Michael. This question is, and I think this is related to, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, 500,000 units that you were sharing yeah. on, the, on the OTC side. Do we have any indication for the return for credit rate? on OTC sales? There's a couple people who've asked that same question. Yeah, 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 I saw that question, Chelsea. We don't have an, an, an absolute number, at the, but some of the data we've seen in the past is hovering around that 25-30% range. Um, so it, it's a it's a decent number, but you know, I also think that the area that we all can actually you know take a look at ourselves is when you look at some of these online channels where they're buying, you know, such as Best Buy or, or Amazon, they have a rating. And, and I think when you look at some of the ratings that we're seeing out there, you know, a lot of them are in that three to four, 4.2% range. So they're getting good satisfaction rates. But I do think, you know, you, you know, return rate is something you obviously have to keep an eye on. For me, that that, that stresses even more of an importance for, for that patient to be seen by one of our healthcare providers, possibly on this call. Because when, when they do have uh, that product or it contraindicates or it doesn't fulfill the need that they, that they have, they've got a professional right there with them you know, to help them through their journey uh, so that they don't fall back into that that realm, that seven to 10 years of, from awareness to treatment. That opportunity to, to have that conversation with a provider, I think is still vitally important. Great. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, okay. So this question, I, I'm not sure if any of you can answer it. So I'll just throw it out to if anyone can answer this question. Um, this person is wondering if we have data on the ASP differences by channel. I think we're hearkening back to that original, your first slide, Michael. Um, so does anyone have that data? Well, Will, do you want to jump in on that one? Uh, I mean, Will? yeah, not to give away what we're going to talk about next week, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we can, um, uh, we can look at private pay ASP um, in a, you know, unbundled and bundled format, different ways to look at it. We can look at uh, average managed care fitting fees which is a little bit different than an ASP, but, um, but we can, we can look at that. Um, but on the, yeah. So, so in that sense, yes, we can do that. And we also have the opportunity in the private pay side, well, maybe in the TPA side too, to look at the, the um, technology levels that are being purchased. And that was again, a, a really interesting piece of data that will um, has picked up uh, as we've, as, as we've seen this change uh, the movement in the premium product uh acquisition of patients. And so it's pretty interesting data there. But yeah, we definitely on the private pay can see the ASP top line. Perfect. Thank you. Um, a couple of people have mentioned there is a typo on the slide. So part three is actually on the following Thursday, which is March 14th. So apologies for that. So next week is one week from today, March 7th. Session two, session three is a week after that, March 14th. So I apologize. We'll send out an email later today as well. And we'll include the links to make sure everybody has the Correct information. Somebody's also asking if they're not able to attend one of the next two sessions, um, can they get a recording? And the answer is yes. Just make sure you register. That way we'll know to send you the recording afterward if you're not able to attend. Um, here's a question, and I, I think I'd throw this out to, to any of you. Um, if you were to open a private practice tomorrow, would you participate with the third parties? Will or Dan, if you want to take that. Michael, feel free. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would say yes. I mean, I, but, but I think the, the important piece is you know, continue to understand your market, you know, continue to understand the, the types of patients that are coming into your to your office. To me, that's a, another plug for MVP because, you know, as we talked about, you know, these patients are finding different ways to enter into the journey, whether it's, you know, through a managed care plan or, you know, coming in through through the marketing efforts that, that you provide, uh, you know, into your, into your different markets. So, yeah, I, I do think, it, you know, it, it is. But I will say, you know, the success of it, heavily depends on your understanding of how it in, how it impacts your, your business. Is your business set up to to operate with third parties? I mean, we, we have clinics you know, all across the country that have decided not to take it. They're thriving. We've seen clinics that have done the opposite and they, and they take it, they take all of them. 
and they're thriving as well because they understand how they're capturing these patients and, and, and you know, what it costs to run their business. They understand those dynamics. Yeah. And I'll jump in and say, you know, absolutely. The If the question is, if I'm opening up, should I add them? The answer is, yeah, the, yes. But you have to take a look at which contracts you want to jump into, which which groups you want to be involved with. But an empty seat, an empty appointment slot that could have been filled with a third party is worth worth less than that reimbursement level. So we have some pretty clear guidelines that we've kind of developed saying, looking at the size and how far out you're scheduled as to whether you should be, you know, accept a lot, accept a few and, or go totally private pay. So yeah, I think that there, you have to take a look at where you are in your, in your business life cycle to determine whether you want to accept TPAs. TPAs are not, this is a way, a lot of patients are finding them are their way to professionals. This is a way for you to, to talk to pay, patients that are hearing impaired. What's critical is that you do not give away your services um, and to reduce your revenue is that you provide services for free that need to be charged that are outside the contracted levels. So these are patients that are going to be on a long time journey. And if you can capture them and show them uh, value and it's through the TPA and it's got reasonable reimbursement, by all means, invite them in. I agree with everything Dan and Michael said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I'll also add one more layer to it. You know, you know, Dan is part of, 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 uh, you know, one of the best groups in the industry with fuel medical, they offer services that, that help you navigate your, navigate through these changes, you know, your fuel pivot, you know, understanding the data with MVP. I mean, these are all the things that are going to help us take this industry to the next level, because we know that there are still patients out there. Our, our penetration rate is still less than 30%. So we know that there are people out there living in silence. So we, we need to meet them, you know, you know, where they want to meet us at. And sometimes it's through a managed care organization. Absolutely. Great. Okay, Michael, this one's for you. Why are managed care hearing aid prices so much less than what private practices have access to? This person says volume, of course, but what else? I mean, volume's a big part of it. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, I, I do think, you know, it, we get this question a lot when it comes to pricing. You know, can we, I don't think at the at the end of the day, you know, us lowering pricing is going to help us, you know, change what's happening in the marketplace. You know, I think running running a, a, a successful business, understanding your margins, understanding the, you know, those costs per hour, like Dan mentioned, understanding what you can charge for. Those are the, the, the things and the tools that are going to help us continue to to survive and thrive in this in this in this marketplace. Um you know, so I, I get the I get the question. We get it a lot, but but yeah, I mean, to me, I think there's so many other things we need to look at uh, other than just price. And and I want to add too, because I, I worked in the manufacturing sector for just a few years on some projects. Um, when we look at those channels, and and as a as a manufacturing business, you have to look at the cost to support each channel. The cost to support the independent channel is is, is a lot higher. That you know they you if you're dealing with a retail, I'm going to take Costco, right? <laughs> That's that's one contract generally managed by one person. But when you take a look at all the independents across the country, you have to have regional reps, you have to have regional trainers, you have to have all the support uh, to for customer service to handle the calls to do. The cost of that channel is um, a lot higher. So I think we have to recognize that as a business cost for the manufacturers and understand that they they've got to answer that because for them it's still a very it's they invest in that channel. They invest in that channel. Um, so it's important to them. And I, I don't think that we can ignore the cost of operating in that channel. Yeah, that's well said, Dan. Yeah, great point. Okay, um, are the hearing aids that are included in the third party plans as high quality as those that are provided in private practices? Michael, do you wanna answer that? Absolutely, yeah, you know, it, it is never our thought or intention to ever you know, put an inferior product out in the marketplace. So yeah, you know, they meet the same quality standards. Um, they they are uh, high quality products that deliver you know great results uh, and benefits to the patients that, that they serve. So absolutely, they meet they they are just as high quality as, as what you would fit in the commercial marketplace. But I want to add in in there too that you know if you if you watch those not not all contracts and not all providers and not and you know you have to take again this comes down to knowing your contract knowing what's being offered. But do you, 
most often, so I'm going to say greater than 50% of the time, you see a maybe an, a one-year-old generation, last generation product that's put into the contract, or they'll put in specific products and perhaps de-feature them slightly. So, I mean, the again, working having worked with the manufacturer on that side, one of the things that's really important is that they bring the very best products to the independents, that the independents, you know, have those really top-line products. Sometimes they find their way into the contract because it's part of the contract negotiation. Sometimes they cannot get around that. That's just part of the part of the game out there. But under again, I, I can't uh, stress enough the you know how how hard the manufacturers work to make sure that the independents are well represented and have the be access to the very best products in the market um, for their patients. It's where they get their best outcomes, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and oh by yeah, and no, and oh by the way. Um, we are fitting as the professionals. We are the ones fitting a lot of the TPA products. So yeah, we demand those good products so that we can do a good job for the patient. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword there. Great. Okay. Well, I think you're probably in the best position to answer this one. So someone's asking if you can pick up or maybe identify the number of units as well as the ASP for the type of units that are being used as TPA alternatives in private practices. Is that anything you've looked at in the MVP data set? Um, that's definitely possible. Um, uh, we'd need to have a conversation, um, just to understand which, which specific products and how they might be categorized. Um, but yes, we have done that, um, on a, uh, company by company basis, not in any sort of like broad sense, because there's products that have come and gone that some have been part of that program at certain parts of time, uh, you know, time periods and other, before that they might've been a, just a flagship premium product. So yeah, we just need to spend a little time kind of defining the parameters, but absolutely, that's doable. Okay, great. Maybe something you can get ready for next week. <laughs> there you go. Um, okay, Michael, here's one for you. There, are, There's at least one other manufacturer that has decided not to sell their like newest, latest premium product via the managed care channel. Does Signia have any interest in that kind of strategy or or no? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, Dan mentioned it kind of earlier, you know, depending on the needs of the contract, we have to make decisions on which products to put in certain plans. But obviously, it's, that, that's, you know, Oticon's, you know, corporate strategy and decision to do that. You know, we, we try to use other methods, you know, via private label and things of that nature to help create, you know, a, a, a clear line of delineation or distinction, you know, between the products. But but again, I'll go back to, you know, what we, we talked about earlier and, and Dan mentioned as well is we want to make sure that, that patients get the best outcomes no matter which way they enter into the channel. So, you know, if, if having our best product there is, is the right way to do it, depending on the plan and what it calls for, you know, we, we obviously are going, to, are going to look at those situations, you know, case by case. Uh, but but we, we are constantly, you know, trying to make sure that, that providers have a distinction and differentiation with the products that they're offering, whether it's through a TPA or a private pay patient. Okay, great. So about the hard balls are all coming for you, Michael. Maybe not too much of a surprise. I but, uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> so I know you can handle it. Um, we've got somebody here who's kind of pushing back on the concept that it's more expensive to service the independent channel than the other channels. Um, and this person's saying, in fact, like they'd be open to reimagining the role of the outside sales rep and some of the things that might be more costly about supporting the independent channel if it could lower their cost of goods. Is that something that you guys have ever talked about or thought about? You know, yeah, I mean, I think our, our, our approach to the marketplace definitely is different, you know, based off of the channel. Um, but but as Dan mentioned, you know, you know, the independent channel does call for a lot of resources. You know, we have programs such as our Aspire program, which, you know, is, is, a, is a program that, that costs, you know, money. It, it, but it's also a great opportunity for uh, us to you know, reward patient, patient loyalty and provide different resources. So the independent channel, it, it's the most costly. It, it just is. I mean, I... I I don't know any other way of really explaining it. You know, you know, not only is it the inside teams, the, the customer service teams that support folks, but it's all the people on the outside as well. The, the outside sales reps, clinical trainers, it's the events that we do uh, to, to bring awareness and, and education, you know, to the marketplace. So there, there's a lot there, but we're, we're always looking at, you know, our approach you know, to the market to make sure it's the right one. And we're always looking at, you know, what are the, the most creative, you know, uh, ways that we can obtain to help our, 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 our customers and those patients out there. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I just can't echo enough. <laughs> uh, you know, I understand what they're asking. They're saying, strip it all down. We don't need all this extra stuff. 
Um, believe me, when you've been on the side of where you've gone into clinics all over the country, they need support. You need the support. It, you know, yes, if you're a super advanced business person, really know your stuff and are, are running at 100%, you don't need the, the programs, you don't need the support, you don't need the trips, you don't need the special. Uh, but if you're not, which is 95% of the marketplace, the, the manufacturers have been there to help these businesses grow. And if you look at the history of our uh, industry, we're, we are here largely because the manufacturers have supported us as independents over the years, and they continue to do that. And I, I think that... Um, you strip those all away. And I think you would see a, a rapid decline in the efficiencies of independence all over the country and, and, and a demand that says, I need more help. I need more services. You, what else are you going to do for me? And I think that that's the competitive side of the manufacturing market is they come up with innovative, innovative ways to bring more value, value, not just price to the products and services we get from our manufacturing partners. And so I think we have to keep that in perspective. Great. Okay. I know Michael's going to have to step away in a minute. So I am going to invite Jerry Weber, who's here from Signia as well, in case he wants to take this question, because you guys might be the best one to answer this, or obviously Will or Dan hop in if you have anything to add. Um, but this person's asking whether we have data on whether the providers that are participating with the TPAs and or fitting the OTC products, do we know if they're audiologists or dispensers? Do we have data on that kind of split? Well, I'm not sure if you have the exact numbers, but speaking from our end, I mean, we see definitely a healthy mix on both sides. Um, you know, there's a couple of specific plans out there that specify it has to be an audiologist. Um, not very many of those, um, but we do definitely see a balance on both sides. So I wouldn't say it's heavily dominated one way or another, uh, but that's just anecdotally from what we see out in the field. So Will, not sure if you have some actual stats around it. Yeah, on the third party side, I think it's I think uh, fairly evenly split. We could take a deeper look at that to confirm that, but that's been my experience. Um, on the OTC side, we have just such limited visibility to the because uh, there's so few OTC products flowing through clinics, which is where we would see them in the MVP data. So uh, so hard to hard to say there. Um, it's, I mean, really, the answer there is like the they're care not professional entirely. Yeah, yeah, neither audiologist nor dispenser, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. That's all the questions we have. So unless one flies in here in the next few seconds. Um, okay, well, I want to really thank everyone for taking time out of their day to be here, both our panelists, as well as our attendees. Again, really looking forward to seeing everybody back here in one week. And um, thanks again, and hope everyone has a great day and a great week. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.